Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. I would ask that last courtesy check by those here in-house to see that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference as well. We have a nice distinguished panel that's being told by the gray hairs here from the last arguments over tax reform, and we'll see if we can do some more for this current session. Hosting our discussion is David Burton, who serves as our Senior Fellow in Economic Policy in our Institute for Economic Freedom and Opportunity. Before joining us here at Heritage, he served as General Counsel at the National Small Business Association. He's also been Chief Financial Officer and General Counsel of the Alliance for Retirement Prosperity and a partner in the Argus Group. He has held posts of Vice President for Finance and General Counsel for New England Machinery, as well as Manager of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Tax Policy Center. Please join me in welcoming David Burton. David. Good morning. In his book, The Life of Reason, George Santiana wrote, progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. When experience is not retained, infancy is perpetual. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Now, at some level, this is obviously true. At another level, it altogether misdiagnosed.
for many decades. Uh, Mark and I actually go back to 1976 when we first started working together at the American Council for Capital Formation. Um, when I left to go to the U.S. Chamber, I never thought Mark would still be there after all these years, but somehow he's managed to survive. <coughs> it's, um, you know, we've been debating his issues virtually all of my adult lifetime, and this will continue, and we never actually settle the questions. But there was a basic lesson. Uh, David asked, what are the basic lessons on successful tax reform? And it's basically go big, go bold, go principled. And we go back to the 1978 capital gains tax reduction, which was really the first supply-side tax rate reduction. And I expect Mark will go into this in much more detail. Um, but at the time, Jimmy Carter had proposed increasing the maximum marginal tax rate on capital gains. It was already up to 49% for some people. He wanted to bring it up to 70%. That was a time when we had double-digit inflation. This was economic madness. Um, you had a great many people, probably most people, were actually paying a capital gains tax on uh, uh, real losses when you did the inflation adjustment. Um, Mark had led sort of a, the lobbying effort for us on the Hill. Congressman Bill Steiger uh, was really the lead here, was really more instrumental than anybody else, uh, and they had come up with a, a tax rate of 28 percent. That's back when you had uh, a number of free market Democrats. I know it's hard to re imagine these days, but Congressman Jim Jones led the Democrat side. We lobbied the Ways and Means Committee, and the Wall Street Journal was the champion under Bob Bartley, who was the editor. Um, they did just a magnificent job in explaining to the American people the necessity to reduce the capital gains tax rate so people would not be being taxed on real losses. Again, the lesson here was that when the facts are on your side, uh, spend a lot of time educating members of Congress, but also the American public, and that really has to be done with our media allies, and again, the Wall Street Journal being very much the lead in there. The other lesson was you had to ignore the revenue scores. Uh, the uh, Joint Tax Committee was then claiming we'd have a several billion dollar loss from, uh, that was back when billions were big numbers, not like the trillions today. But we had this big loss, and I was, uh, they selected me to give the testimony uh, on the affirmative, and I argued we would have a revenue gain. I didn't really specify the size of the gain, but it greatly surpassed any of our expectations the first year out. Um, we were not precise, but at least we had the direction of our sign right. In the years since, the Joint Tax Committee continued to make the error, and uh, with uh, they couldn't even get their sign right on the capital gains tax. I want to give a little bit of historical background because people forget about this. In 1971, there was a Scottish economist, still very much alive, James Murleys. He won the Nobel Prize in 1996, along with Bill Vickery, who had been professor at Columbia, and uh, Vickery was one of my mentors. And um, Murleys had done a, a very comprehensive study, both theoretical and empirical study, trying to determine what the optimum rate of taxation should be uh, both to maximize social welfare and the trade-offs between efficiency, economic growth, and his definitions of fairness. Murleys at the time had been pretty much a socialist. He was an advisor to the British Labor uh, Party. And when he undertook his study, the maximum marginal tax rate in Britain was 83 percent, if you can imagine. He thought that as initially going into it, he thought his research would pretty well support that. But as he wrote uh, in his 80, uh, 71 paper and then repeated many times afterwards, I must confess that I had expected the rigorous analysis of income taxation in a utilitarian manner to provide an argument for high tax rates. It has not done so. He concluded the maximum tax rate should be 20 percent, not 83 percent. And this, he said this is for the upper income, but he concluded basically for all people. 
he had come up with a number of other uh, unexpected, from his standpoint, uh, conclusions which were highly politically incorrect. And one was that actually you could have a higher, if you want to just maximize revenue, often you could make more by having higher tax rates on the middle class. And he actually disaggregated people down into various types of, uh, of professions and so forth, looking at all this. Because let's, uh, I think a modern day example is that we take somebody here in Washington who is a government employee, and uh, they don't, you know, one of these employees that doesn't work very hard, I know there's not very many of them, but probably you, you have met them, and they have no danger of getting fired, but they don't work very hard. And they also know they probably couldn't get another job and pay anywhere near as well. So you could greatly increase the marginal tax rate on these folks, and they would still continue to show up for whatever minimal time they're required to. They still would not be any more or any less productive. And you could probably hit them 50 or 60 percent, maybe even higher. Uh, yesterday, by happenstance, I had given a, a talk to a group of, uh, of Air Force officers and also civilians, uh, middle, upper management people with the Air Force. And I asked them what was the highest tax rate anybody should be expected to pay. And I was very surprised because this is a group who we did not think would be all tax sensitive because they're in it for the cause. And virtually all of them was 20% or less. And I had a couple would go up as far as 30%. Um, we know just from other surveys of the American people, people don't think people ought to make more than 20%. But going back to Murley's work, he, of course, identified the fact that the more income you make, also the greater flexibility you have to opt out, to figure out how the income can be made, to move elsewhere. And so upper income people are much more sensitive to tax rates than many people in the middle. We've gotten away from understanding these basic principles. The people at the Tax Foundation, I see Steve Enton here, who has done a yeoman's work over the years, getting people to try to understand this. Um, going back to the 78 capital gains tax cut, our, uh, our good friend, Art Laffer, was magnificent in explaining the, through the Laffer curve, you know, how people would opt out legally, illegally, uh, from very high tax rates. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't remember Art specifically referring to Murley's work. Steve, you might know more about that. And Bob Mundell, of course, was uh, sort of Art's mentor in some of this stuff. And I know Bob is familiar, of course, with uh, Murley's work. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, when we argue for tax rates higher than 20 percent, there's no real evidence that this provides you with more revenue over the long run, that it adds anything to the social welfare. And I say, why should we do this? We should go back to our basic principles here. When Reagan and Kemp had the first tax rate cut in uh, 2001, they were viewed as totally radicals. There had been the Kemp-Roth bill beforehand. Steve had worked on that. And um, that was dropping tax rates by about 30 percent, from 70 down to 50 for the highest rate and cutting everybody else's rate down, uh, down the line. And the left said, oh, this is just grossly irresponsible. Cutting tax rates by 30 percent, this will be a disaster. And um, we made a mistake. And when I say we, the, the basically members of Congress and all of those of us who were involved, including a number of the panelists and Steve Ents and others, by conceding to go to a three-year phase-in. And the one thing we learned from the phase-in, that people had a great incentive to delay the realization of income. And so the full benefits of that tax cut really didn't take place to 83, and that's when the economy really took off. So again, be, be bold, go big, don't phase things in, uh, particularly if people can real, uh, defer the realization of income. And part of this is getting people to understand the long run. I still find people today saying the Reagan tax cuts, oh, they didn't pay for themselves and so forth and so on. They, they point to the big deficits afterwards. Part of the deal was that Reagan had with Congress and Tip O'Neill is there would be a bigger reduction in spending. 
The Democrats didn't deliver on their part. We had to increase defense spending at the time to win the Cold War. That was a correct, that was a correct decision on the part of Reagan. Um, even so, those deficits quickly came down by the end of the Reagan administration, and um, our deficit GDP ratio actually was falling, so that was fine. Um, I would risk that same thing again, even with those deficits. Um, but focusing on the long run, people have too short a view with the long run. And they often talk about two or three years. And they say the Reagan tax cuts didn't pay for themselves. Well, none of us ever argued they were going to pay for themselves instantaneously, and particularly the high end. We all said they would lose revenue at those tax cuts at the lower end. When you're cutting tax rates for people under 15 percent, you're going to lose revenue. But we didn't lose any revenue from the, the top cuts. But even that takes a while for people to adjust. I'll give you one example. If you're going to plant trees now, let's say you want to go into a, a, be a tree farmer. You've got a 50-year crop. Now, if you're making the decision to make, that, to make that investment because you're going to have to do fire protection, pest control, thinning for a 50-year period before you're going to realize income. So you've got to make certain assumptions about what the tax policy is going to be. And so tax policies made today can have as long as a half-century lifespan to measure the long run correctly. Um, how much more time do I have, David? Okay. Um, then, of course, we had the 86 Tax Act, which was real reform in terms of really bringing down the rates. Got the maximum marginal rate down to 28%. We had two brackets, 15 and 28%, um, closing up a lot of so-called tax expenditures. Uh, I have trouble with that definition, but that's a whole another panel. But <clears throat> the, the, the system was pretty close to a flat tax. And uh, but a couple mistakes were made. The biggest one, in my judgment, was increasing the capital gains tax rate up to 28%. And it took us until 1996 to unwind that, uh, that mistake under the Clinton-Gingrich uh, uh, the capital gains cut in 1996. So again, the 86 Act, and you mentioned Jeff Birnbaum's book. Actually, I went back and looked at it when I knew I was going to do this panel. And uh, I remember when Jeff wrote the book, I said he had some of the stuff incorrect, and I reread it, and I was right. Some of the stuff is incorrect, but he's pretty close to the mark. It's a pretty good book. And, uh, but um, it, uh, some of his characterizations of the economic effects of the first raking tax cuts, um, he still didn't understand at that time. I think he does now. The, again, the lesson there is go big, go bold, because the tax writing committees and all the players were somewhat stymied until finally Packwood, who was uh, Senator Packwood, was uh, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, and they finally decided to go all the way with the 28% maximum marginal tax rate. Of course, within uh, five years, it began to unwind. And um, that was under the first George Bush, who has famously said, read my lips, no new taxes. I was heavily involved with that whole thing. And um, when I could see by the beginning, uh, actually the four months after he got elected, he started to walk away from the things that we had written and proposed for him. And um, I could see a disaster coming, so I basically decided I was out of there and because uh, yeah, I could see the coming disaster. The, it's, it's interesting here. I just I went back uh, and looked at what was the individual tax revenue as a percentage of GDP when the tax rate, marginal tax rate, maximum marginal tax rate was 28 percent. Turns out to be 7.9 percent of GDP for the average of those few years. So then we look back and I found some years under when we had a 70 percent marginal tax rate, such as 1978, uh, the tax revenues as a percentage of GDP were also 7.9 percent. Last year we had a 39.6 uh, percent top marginal rate what were tax, individual tax revenues as a percentage of GDP? 
And there's little evidence that you can ever get much above that for a sustained period of time, no matter what rate structure you have. Um, we find that other countries around the world, when they went to flat taxes, I was chairman of the Bulgarian transition team, and they put a 10% maximum marginal tax rate in there, and revenue soared. When the Russians came in with their 13.3% flat rate tax, revenue soared. We have, a, what, Steve, 30, or Dan, 30 countries now to have um, basically flat taxes. Uh, I'm a, I actually would prefer a consumption tax, but if you're going to have an income tax, the rate ought not to be higher than 20%. For the corporations, and we can, that's a whole other discussion of what the, where that should be, here the administration is trying to uh, penalize people for doing in what they call inversions, you know, the merger with foreign firms. If you're running a company, of course, you have to be fulfill your, fis your fiduciary responsibilities to your stockholders, and if you can save a lot of money by moving the corporation outside of the U.S., you should. And I understand the good folks at the Tax Foundation now say that the revenue maximizing rate for a corporate tax ought to be about 14%. I think ideally we want to abolish it. Ideally we want to abolish the individual capital gains tax, but we shouldn't be arguing for t corporate tax rates of more than 14, 15 percent. And with that, I expect my time is up. Thank you, sir. Well, first of all, uh, let me thank Dan for hosting the uh, Dan Burton for hosting this. Let me. It's Steve. <laughs> Dan Mark's, Burton. Mark's, Mark's getting old. I am getting old. <laughs> you should know that um, um, Richard actually got involved in tax policy under uh, Calvin Coolidge. Um, <laughs> Jerry Scheib of the Wall Street Journal, the bureau chief, said, I've been involved in tax policy since I was 14 years old, and so I went back to my chair and did the mathematics, which means I was involved since 1954. Uh, when the tax code started. I do want to say thank Heritage for hosting it. Heritage has been in the forefront of, of tax reform for many years, and quite frankly, I'm privileged, I think, to be in the same room with Steve Enton, who played such an important role, Evan Lidier, who did, um, also on the Hill. Um, and I cannot say enough about Richard Ron. Um, he was a leader of the supply side movement. He was involved in every tax. Um, debate. Uh, everything I did right uh, is because of what Richard taught me. Everything that I do wrong is because I didn't listen. Steve Moore, without Steve Moore, I don't think you would have had the Reagan Revolution. And, <laughs> I wasn't even here yet. <laughs> and, 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 he was, and, and he wasn't even here there, so you can see his great influence. Um, and then we're, we're talking about uh, Dan Mitchell, too. So having said that, um, maybe what I could add... Uh, 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 what I could add is, is, is the lessons learned from past tax reform, and less of the economics, but more the, the politics. Why did we have a tax reform act? Why did we have tax reform in 1978? Why did we have tax reform in 1981? Why in 86? Why after Camp did all that great work last year? Why didn't we have it um, last year? And why will it take place in? And I will um, perhaps tell you when, what that date is, uh, depending how the discussion goes. So let's address those, those, those issues. And I've come up with my own list of six elements that contribute to tax reform happening. Um, and those could be good or bad tax reform. And let me briefly go, go through those. Um, Dan referred to uh, George Santayana. And I would like to depart, add to that and say those who have not learned from past tax reforms are doomed to pay for future ones. So remember that uh, if you don't learn the lessons from this panel. What is the first lesson? It's not an overnight momentum. These things build. In other words, you can't show up for those of you who work on the Hill and get your member to introduce a bill and think you're going to have tax reform. It's a wave. It's an overall uh, pent-up demand for tax reform. And throughout my comments, I'm going to talk about 78, which was the capital gains tax cut, 81, the first Reagan, 86, the Tax Reform Act, and of course the one that will arrive when I may let you know what that date is. So if we talk about the overnight, uh, it's not an overnight phenomenon, what happened in 78? You had built up inflation. As Richard said, you were paying taxes on inflationary gains. You had stagflation under Jimmy Carter. Uh, you had um, a peculiar uh, political event in Silicon Valley. They were unable to get uh, venture capital for Silicon Valley startups. 
Uh, and you had this malaise, similar to the one we have now. And one of the peculiar things, or one of the reasons this thing took off, is this entrepreneur actually came to Washington and said, I have to sell all my companies to the Japanese because I can't raise enough venture capital. So there was a built-up malaise, built-up economic problems, and that, that is something that was a predicate for the Tax Reform Act of, of 78. If you go further and you look at 86, which was a tax reform uh, act, what were some of the uh, things that were uh, built up? First of all, you had, um, you had um, widespread discontent with the tax code. The rich folks were getting away with murder. Uh, Democrats were concerned because there were so many loopholes. Republicans were upset, especially supply cider, because we needed to have lower uh, tax rates. And the Kemp-Roth movement didn't appear overnight. Again, um, it, it's not, not an overnight uh, phenomenon, but you need this, this pent-up demand to trigger tax reform. What's the second lesson that one can learn about past and future uh, tax reforms? You need a trigger. You need something to ignite uh, the flame for tax reform. Well, let's look at three types of triggers. Leadership. Sometimes leadership is a lack of leadership. Under Jimmy Carter, you had a president who really wasn't doing much. He became sort of irrelevant. And so there was a vacuum in leadership. And so you had the pent-up demand, and you had the supply-side movement, you had the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, and you had individuals who can make a difference, like many of these uh, at the table here. Um, then you've got a different type of leadership, Ronald Reagan in 81. He built on, on what had been going on for years, the supply-side movement. Um, he, um, he ran on it in his campaign. Um, and, and that's an example of, of, of leadership, which you don't have many Ronald Reagans on the left or right here today. Uh, another example of leadership, which is lacking now, uh, you had leadership, bipartisan leadership. You had Ronald Reagan, a Republican president, working with a war dealer from Chicago, Rosinkowski, the Democratic chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And you had a, an interesting person in the United States Senate by the name of Bob Packwood, who was a Republican. And they all wanted to do tax reform. Again, the trigger leadership. Another type of trigger is a vehicle. Uh, one that didn't work was the idea of a grand bargain that was going to help take advantage of the pent-up demand. Remember, that was supposed to happen last year. It did not. Uh, another type of vehicle um, is uh, hopefully not a severe economic crisis. In 2008, the whole thing collapsed, and basically the administration went up to the hill and said, we've got to do something. Uh, they did the wrong thing, but I suspect if something like that happened again, you just grab for whatever you think might happen. It could help. And then finally, um, today in the paper, there are, there are stories about if, if Senator McConnell becomes a uh, the majority leader, what will he do? And he was talking about tying in tax extenders, and we always talk about the debt ceiling being a way uh, to force a uh, tax reform. So the three types of triggers, again, could be leadership, a vehicle, or a crisis. The third element that I think we should look at, uh, Richard alluded to, and this is peculiar uh, to tax policy, but it is critical to determine whether or not uh, we get tax reform, and that's this concept called tax expenditures. And very, very simply, we have an income tax in the United States. There is a fellow by the name of Stanley Surrey who said that should be the departure point for any tax reform. If you have an income tax, something like a lower capital gains tax, or an IRA is considered a loophole because it is a departure of taxing everything. Now, that makes it very, very hard for people in this, at this table to argue for economic growth incentives because they are tax expenditures or, or, or tax loopholes. And that is something which Evan and Steve and all of us here know that has constrained our ability to do tax reform uh, for many, many years. Now, the interesting thinking about tax expenditures, in other words, focusing on loopholes or focusing on fairness, sometimes growth triumphs that. That is to say, we were able to reduce the capital gains tax in 78 because people were more concerned about growth, about the Silicon Valley fellow who couldn't get money for startups. And again, that was the Reagan philosophy, growth. So growth in that time was a way to sort of get over the concern about fairness, which is what a lot of these tax expenditures are about. The fourth uh, element to, that could make or not make tax reform, and that's dynamic scoring. As Richard pointed out, um, that is always a constraint, because if you have a tax cut that encourages growth, uh, the government won't recognize it. And as Richard has pointed out, uh, when we've had capital gains tax cuts in 78, after 78, we had revenues go up. 
because of a technical concept that calls unlocking. You no longer want to hold. If you have a capital gains, you can determine when it's paid because you, it's a question about whether you take the capital gains tax. But more importantly, because of the economic impact of lower capital gains, tax cuts on entrepreneurship and the economy in whole. So whenever we've had lower capital gains tax, taxes, we've had economic growth and more revenue uh, to, the, um, to the Treasury. There's an interesting anecdote about dynamic scoring, which I think will be relevant also for the future. And that is when Richard led the effort in 1978 to reduce capital gains tax, I don't know how many of you people work on the Hill, but there's an office called the Joint Committee on Taxation, which scores, de determines how much capital uh, tax cuts or tax increases, what the impact will be on revenue. But it's static. It's not dynamic. It doesn't look at, at what happens in the real world. So they, this is what always happens. Well, Richard came up with a good idea. Why don't we introduce economic econometric models? And so they're sitting there and the Joint Committee on Taxation says if you reduce capital gains tax, it's going to cost all this revenue. And the members of Congress, if you work for members of Congress, they hate the bureaucrats in, in Congress, you know, who constrain them. All of a sudden, Richard shows up with this econometric model that says, look at the dynamic impact. And they applaud whether or not they're for or against uh, lower capital gains taxes because somebody took on these bureaucrats in Congress. So then the, 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 the people in Congress opposing capital gains uh, criticized our first econometric model. And while they were criticizing that, we came up with another one and another one. And Bob Samuelson, the journalist, came up with a phrase, have model will travel. So the point being is, is dynamic scoring is something that's out there. And thank goodness, uh, 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 Ryan, Paul Ryan, is going to make dynamic scoring uh, one of his top priorities. What is the, uh, the, fifth, uh, the fifth one? The fifth one is one of my favorites being more of a, a lobbyist than, a, than an economist, although I probably am not successful either. And that is what Bismarck once said. And remember, Richard goes back to Calvin Coolidge, but Richard was all, Ron was also a good friend of Otto von Bismarck, the former chancellor. Of, of Germany, who very once said, tax law and sausages are two things you do not want to, to be seen made. Uh, and that's a, re a reality if you look at the tax legislative process. And there are a couple of interesting, this is, this is a dynamic, uh, which one has to understand as you get involved in tax reform. You have to be able to use that. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting anecdotes about that. Senator Moynihan, the distinguished Harvard professor, uh, <clears throat> who grew, was born in Oklahoma but talked like an it is English Don one day at a Senate Finance Committee markup, was startled to see that we were going to make tax increases retroactive. And he said, that is un-American. How can this happen? And the reality is uh, you can do whatever you want, Russell Long said with the majority of the committee. So if you talk about tax, you worry about things like that. You worry about encouraging certain members of Congress to go along with an amendment and they get a little uh, a carve out for themselves. Um, or you worry about silos. If you're going to increase taxes on, in one for the business, you have to d pay for it. In fact, there was a former congressman named Frank Arini, Frank Arini of New Jersey, who always had to pay for it. And the problem is when he had to pay for for his favorite tax reform measure, somebody would steal it, and that's called being Frank Arini. So if you talk about um, when you get into the process of tax reform, that's something you need to worry about. Now I have one final point. Uh, on that you ought to look at. Remember I said um, tax reform comes about, is not an overnight phenomenon. But there is another phenomenon, and that is a pitcher of beer can bring about big things. And as, as uh, our, our friend over here who worked for Senator Packwood pointed out, in 1986, when you had the 86 um, tax reform coming, it always died, it always came back, and Senator Packwood had a, a, a pitcher of beer once at, 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 at a local place on the Senate side, and lo and behold, he resurrected tax reform, and it became a reality. Now, having said that, um, I said I would tell you uh, what's going to happen next. How many of you people heard of Jerry Scheib? Hey, OK. He's the Washington uh, editor of the Wall Street Journal. How many people have heard of Al Hunt? Al Hunt, OK. As you know, he's been a pundit for many years. And how many people think anything I say today makes any sense? OK, nobody. OK, having said that, here's what I think will happen next. Jerry Scheib predicted uh, that you really do get legislation passed uh, with a, a president of one party and a Congress of another. And this is an assertion he made in a recent um, uh, column. And then the Washington Post, I'm not talking about whether you agree with him or not, did the research. And they found out if you look at major pieces of legislation being passed, 
they were passed with divided government. Whether that's going to happen or not, um, we'll, we'll see. The second thing is Al Hunt. And this is something Richard alluded to. Al Hunt wrote a piece earlier this year said tax reform through the income tax is no longer possible. That is to say the loopholes, the preferences are so entrenched that you won't be able to fix the income tax. I believe that and I think therefore you may go to another type of tax, not just an income tax. Um, and I think that opens all sorts of opportunities. And finally, me, um, I believe that sooner or later uh, you're going to have a consumed income tax, which is not a value-added tax for two reasons. Number one, it is a way to deal with the problems of eliminating preferences because you aren't, you aren't, um, uh, you're trying something new because you couldn't fix the income tax. And so you're trying something new by eliminating saving and investment. You can deal with progressivity. You can deal with all these type of problems. So I think politically it's very intriguing. And then finally, I think economically uh, it is the way to go for greater economic growth. So thank you very much. Thank you, David, for the invitation to be here. It's always good to come back to my old uh, stomping grounds at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, I have a couple of points I want to quickly go through, uh, things that I've sort of learned in my three decades of uh, being involved in these issues. Uh, number one, tax base matters more than people think. Uh, when, when, when Mark was talking about consumed income tax, what does that mean? That's a tax base issue. It's what's being taxed, not just the rate. And there is a fight between those who believe in a consumed income tax base, which means no double taxation of savings and investment, versus those who believe in what's called the hague Simons tax base. This gets into what Stanley Surrey would have believed in uh, back when he was here in town. Uh, and it's all about how you treat capital. And it's one of the reasons why there was dissatisfaction by some on the right uh, with the 86 Tax Reform Act, because yes, it did dramatically lower tax rates, but it also increased the double taxation of saving and investing. Uh, and that caused a lot of angst among people. And sometimes you get bipartisan pieces of legislation, such as non uh many years ago. And that was a consumed income tax because it got rid of all the double taxation. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes you have things that are just tax cuts that don't really affect uh, the existing amount of double taxation. But it's not, you know, most people, when they think about the controversies over tax reform, they think it's all about, well, class warfare discussions about what the top tax rate should be, or special interest debates about whether or not you're going to have this itemized deduction or that loophole or that tax preference. And yes, those things are part of the debate, but the tax base is really critical because right now, between the capital gains tax, the corporate income tax, the double tax on dividends, and the death tax, you can have a single dollar of income taxed as many as four times, but it's only because th those, those multiple layers of tax only exist uh, when people save and invest. If you immediately consume your after-tax income, the federal government leaves you alone. If you save and invest, something every economic theory says is critical for long-run growth, that's when all the double and triple taxation uh, is imposed upon you. So the tax base is something that is absolutely critical for tax reform, but it doesn't get a lot of attention in terms of the public debate outside the Beltway. Uh, another point, I would agree with uh, what Richard said in his opening comments, bold beats timid. Uh, I remember way back going to uh, Alvin Rabushka introducing the flat tax in the early 80s and then Dick Armey popularizing it uh, along with Steve Forbes in the 1990s. There were always various politicians coming up with incremental reforms, which they thought were very clever because, oh, we're going to deal with this special interest group by giving them a carve out. We're not going to be quite so bold. We're going to have two rates or three rates instead of one rates. Nobody remembers those tax reform plans. They never got any traction. I think that a big, bold tax reform, something like a flat tax where you sweep everything away has more appeal to people. And in part, and this is another point uh, that deserves separate treatment, people like a bold plan because they assume that the current system is riddled with corruption. When the flat tax first became a big issue in the 1990s, I would go out and I'd give my speeches about marginal tax rates and capital formation and double taxation, and I would see the audience beginning to nod away. Uh, but then when I started talking about all the loopholes and corruption and special interests, uh, favor-seeking in Washington, they got all excited. 
They saw the flat tax as a proxy for reducing or eliminating political corruption in Washington. And I think when you go bold, it gives you that extra weapon in your, in your arsenal to argue that you're going to get rid of uh, all the, you know, the, the Gucci Gulch lobbyists uh, that uh, Jeff Birnbaum wrote about. And, and the corruption, I think, does matter. If you look at the amount of lobbyists in town, you chart that against the number of pages in the tax code. And yes, that's a kind of silly correlation, but I do think under Underneath it, there is some rationale that the more complex the tax code is, when you have 75,000 pages or so of tax code and regulations, that is a sandbox. It's a playground for the special interest groups. And that's one of the reasons why really bold tax reform uh, has more support uh, than modest tax reform. I also think an argument that we don't use enough is competitiveness. 30 or 40 years ago, when nations were sort of islands with very little cross-border economic activity, you could probably afford to get away with bad tax policy. But now that there's been globalization and there's a gigantic increase in the amount of especially cross-border investment, but even cross-border uh, labor flows, I think competitiveness matters a lot. And of all the debates and that I've done with my friends on the left, sometimes you know we'll, we'll, we'll clash on class warfare, and we all know each other's arguments, and I feel like we fight to a draw on a lot of these issues. But on the issue of competitiveness in a global economy, I don't think they have a good answer, and they've never had a good answer. When it's so easy for jobs and investment to cross national borders, it's insane to have a tax system that's so punitive. And this, of course, shows up very much in the issue about corporate taxation and the whole in inversion issue. When we have the highest corporate tax rate in the world, of course companies don't want to be domiciled here. Uh, and even if you ban inversions, that doesn't stop the economic growth from occurring outside America's borders because we're fundamentally uncompetitive. But by the way, this brings me back to my first point about the tax base. Uh, because sometimes politicians say, okay, we'll lower the corporate tax rate, but we'll make depreciation schedules more punitive, or we'll expand our onerous system of worldwide taxation. Uh, and so your rate might go down, but your corporate tax system at the end of the day would actually be worse than it is right now if you don't get the tax base issue right. But now speaking of competitiveness, Something that's a hobby horse of mine is I'm very concerned about some of these international efforts by the OECD and others to try to harmonize taxation in a particularly punitive way. The whole OECD anti-tax competition initiative is premised on the notion that there should be double taxation of income that is saved and invested, and there should be worldwide taxation. And th so they're, in effect, trying to rewrite and, and put in place a system of harmonized tax rules for the world that would, in effect, undermine pro growth tax reform, which is one of the reasons uh, why I think one of the biggest budget cuts we should have, it's actually not a big budget cut, but one of the most important budget cuts we should have is zero out U.S. subsidies for the OECD because of their work in favor of very bad tax <laughs> policy. Uh, in terms of tax reform, I want to also make the point that good tax reform is probably the best thing we can do in terms of reforming the health care system. Why? Because the biggest loophole in the tax code is the exclusion for, for our fringe benefits. You bring fringe benefits into the tax code, and I think insurance, instead of being sort of these gold-plated, all-you-can-eat Cadillac plans will begin to have a system instead where insurance is for things like unexpected catastrophic costs, which, of course, is exactly the way it works for home insurance and auto insurance. Uh, our, we have a dr huge problem with third-party payer in the American health care system. Uh, some of it's Medicare, some of it's Medicaid, and yes, Obamacare makes it worse, but we really need to fix the tax code if we want to fix the health care system. I want to echo what's already been said about fixing the Joint Committee on Taxation. <laughs> I mentioned before, sometimes I have debates with my left-wing friends. One of the common debates is, what's the revenue maximizing point on the Laffer curve? You get the Paul Krugman types who say it's up around 70% or 80%. Uh, Richard mentioned that, uh, according to Murley's, it's around 20%. But you know what? There's one group that's way out of whack with even Paul Krugman, and that's the Joint Committee on Taxation, because they assume the revenue maximizing rate is 100%. I remember my former boss, Bob Packwood, sent a letter to Joint Tax, uh, I think it was back in 1989. He asked, give me the revenue estimates for a 100% tax rate on income over $200,000 a year. And they basically came back and said it's like $200 billion the first year, then $230, 260 And so Packwood writes back, and I'm being colloquial because, of course, he worded it in a much more mature fashion than I would have. Uh, but the way I would have worded it, and he basically asked the same question, is, are you guys smoking crack? Do you really think that people will continue to work and earn income and report income at a 100% tax rate? 
And so the Joint Committee on Taxation, eventually, this is back before computers, so they sent back a letter. And you go down, you look at their revenue estimate after Packwood asked them to reconsider it. And they had the exact same numbers, but this time they had an asterisk. You follow the asterisk to the bottom of the page, and it said, our model assumes that tax policy has no impact on employment, income, GDP, et cetera, et cetera. And they still think that that's still the way they operate. Yeah, and then they, maybe they've, they've tinkered a little bit, uh, but fundamentally, uh, their models assume that there's only two variables, tax rates and, and tax revenue. In reality, there's a third very important variable, and that's taxable income. And what was said before about rich people that Richard was talking about in terms of Murley's looking at different revenue maximizing tax rates for different groups, the rich are different than you and me, or at least they're different than me. Uh, if, if you're rich, let's, you can buy me dinner tonight. But one thing we know about the rich is they have tremendous control over the timing, level, and composition of their income. A rich person can go on their computer and just like that shift all their investments into tax-free municipal bonds. So the tax rate can go up to 90% and all of a sudden revenue from the rich will go to zero because they'll figure out ways that are very simple and very legal not to pay any tax uh, whatsoever. And then my final point is that growth trumps fairness. If you're in an environment where tax rates are going up, guess what? The class warfare crowd is going to win because if tax rates are going up, if the politicians are talking about increasing the fiscal burden on Americans, uh, the average person is going to say, don't tax me, tax someone else, tax the rich guy. Uh, and so that's an environment where the left is always going to win. On the other hand, if you have an environment where you're saying, we're going to try to figure out an, uh, some sort of new tax system that's going to increase economic growth so we get more jobs, more opportunity, uh, more prosperity, more competitiveness, I think that wins. The left tried to use class warfare against Reagan in the 80s, and Reagan beat them. Uh, because the average person instinctively agreed that you don't want to have high marginal tax rates. Nobody should pay, as I think Richard or David said, more than 20 or 30 percent of their income. Uh, but the key thing, I think, about the Reagan tax cuts that allowed him to succeed, uh, whereas when you have tax increase environments like under uh, the first President uh, Bush, is that growth matters to people, especially in a competitive global economy. So what's the lesson of that for tax reform? It probably means that at the very least you need dynamic scoring so you can have a static tax cut in terms of uh, your legislation, but you probably even want a tax cut even on, on a dynamic basis. And that, of course, brings you to the real fundamental challenge to tax reform. So long as government keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, our chances of good tax policy get smaller and smaller and smaller. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be with you. Uh, thanks for coming over to Heritage. Um, Richard, always good to be with you. I learned a lot uh, from your talk, stuff that I had forgotten. And by the way, every time I'm with Richard Ron, I just, I think you've all been talking about these old adages from the past. And, you know, the old Ed Crane adage about Richard Ron, that in the land of the blind, that is Washington, D.C., the one-eyed man is king. <laughs> and you always will be, uh, Richard. And um, thank you for what you did, actually, for this country in, in terms of uh, being so instrumental in the 81 tax cuts and the 81, 86 tax reform. Um, give you all a number just to think about. And you all on this panel can't answer this because I know you you know the answer, but I wonder who in the audience can answer this. The number I'm going to give you is 97 to 3. 97 to 3. That was a vote in the United States Senate. And I wonder if anyone could tell me what vote that was. That was the vote that approved that that was the Senate vote for the 1986 Tax Reform Act. 97 to 3. We brought the highest tax rate, as Richard uh, and Mark said, down to from 50 percent down to 28 percent, I'm cleared out all of the junk and the all the junk in the stables of the Tax Act, and we got 97 votes. Ted Kennedy, I think, voted for the for the 86 Act. Uh, Metzenbaum voted for the Tax Reform Act of 86. Um, it was one of the great bipartisan achievements, you know, in my opinion, of the last 50 years. And the question is, can we can we do it again? And I have some skepticism about whether we can because of the makeup of the Democratic Party today. I mean, you go back to 1986. I mean, that was, by the way, I wasn't here for the 81 Tax Act, Richard, but I was involved in the, in the 85, 86, 87 debate about uh, tax reform. And the thing that was so interesting about that was that the champions of that were not just Republicans. I mean, you know, we were working with Bill Bradley. We were working with Dick Gephardt, who was the senator from Louisiana. Um, 
What? It's bro. Right. I mean, all of these guys were very instrumental in in making that happen. And the question I would ask as we think about tax reform, where are the Bill Bradleys today in the Democratic Party? Where are the Dick Upharts? I mean, I just, I don't see them right now. I was really so discouraged. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with you all. I think this is one of the most important things we can do for the country. Um, I was so discouraged. It was almost exactly a year ago. Chuck Schumer gave a speech and he said, we're not interested in tax reform. We don't, we want yeah we'll close the tax loopholes that Dan talked about. We'll we'll get rid of those loopholes, but we have no interest in re- reducing rates. You know he said in fact I th- we think that the rates should be higher on rich people. So that bipartisan consensus and I hope I'm wrong about this. It seems to have evaporated a little bit, and that's what we have to get back. Um, I want to bring forward the history. You all talk about what happened in the '80s. Let me kind of bring you all up to date on what's happened since then. Um, I'll never forget um, riding in my car home from work when I was at Heritage, my final days on my first stint at Heritage, and I'm riding in my car uh, down um, Connecticut Avenue, and the 5 o'clock news comes on and says, George Bush Sr. has agreed to tax revenue increases as part of a big budget deal. And literally, I am, I, what? And I almost, I almost uh, crashed my car into the oncoming lane. Um, that was the end of tax reform. Right? That was the end of tax reform, when, when we had a Republican president who agreed to raise the tax rates, and once he agreed to raise the tax rates, it was just a free-for-all. And then, of course, what happened was the rates you know, went up a little bit, down a little bit, uh, you know, under, they went down a little bit under Bush, they went back up under Clinton, they went back up under uh, uh, um, Obama now, and so on. And the other thing that's obviously happened is that since this has been now, what, 28 years since we did the 86 Act, we haven't cleaned out the tax tables in 28 years. And the, and the tax code today is a god-awful mess. It's an ugly, ugly thing. I mean, you, all of the stuff we got rid of, so many of those things we got rid of in 86 Act, they're back in spades uh, today in the tax code. It's worse, uh, arguably, than ever before in terms of um, all the deductions and loopholes. Um, so, um, you know, today you, you got the, the tax deductions for windmills and you've got the tax deductions for ethanol and race car drivers and all of this stuff that just makes uh, little sense. Um, another point I wanted to make. Um, Janet Yellen gave a speech on Friday, which was really one of the worst speeches by a Fed chairman in a long, long, long time, but it was, it was very revealing, and she talked about income inequality, and, and she got her history completely wrong. She said that in the last several decades that, um, you know, income inequality has gone up, and the poor have made no progress, and the middle class have made no progress, and that's just completely wrong. I mean, the 1980s and 1990s, the middle class made huge gains. I mean, that was one of the great periods of prosperity for American history. Uh, and Janet Yellen doesn't get that. I mean, if you look at what have a middle income, um, uh, middle class incomes over from the period 1982, from the time of the Reagan tax cuts through uh, 2005, m- real middle income households had a 33% increase in their incomes. That's a lot of money in a very, fairly short period of time. I bring that up because I think this connection that uh, Dan and Mark were making about capital uh, tax is really, really important. And I think this is something I hope that Janet Yellen gets, but I'm not so sure she does. That when you cut the taxes on capital, and there have been a lot of really good studies on this, a lot of the gains from that don't just accrue to the owners of the capital, the people who own the stocks and the businesses, but to the workers themselves. And one of the reasons you want to make capital less expensive and more investment in the U.S. economy is because that's what leads to higher wages. So, Madam Chairwoman, if you want to increase the incomes of people at the bottom, the most important thing you can do is cut taxes on capital now. David, I hope I got my <laughs> economics on that right. And uh, there is, I think there's a wrong perception on the left that the only people who benefit when you cut capital gains tax or dividend tax and so on are people at the top. Um, two other uh, quick points. One is, I mean, Dan is so right. On the corporate income tax rate system, you know, we've all been doing these debates for 30 years with people on the left about how, whether tax rates matter. And I would simply just throw this out to you. Does anybody, after watching what's happened in just the last year with these corporate inversions, can any person really make the argument that tax rates don't matter? 
I mean, we've seen this kind of vivid, real-life example right before our very eyes of iconic American companies leaving this country. <laughs> and they're leaving the country because our t corporate tax rate is too high. And we remember we had the debate here, what it was about three weeks ago, with, uh, with somebody from Senate Budget Policy Priorities, a nice woman, a tax expert. She couldn't you know, she didn't have any answer for why these companies are leaving if tax rates don't matter. So I think we have learned an important lesson for why tax rates matter. I do think, uh, I agree with, I think, the point that Mark made about, you know, I think the corporate tax system just doesn't work anymore. The whole way we're, we're taxing corporate tax, and we're going to have to move towards something like a business sales tax, where you're just taxing businesses on, on what they produce, and it's a kind of consumption tax model. Because as I put it, you know, when we talked about this a month ago, our corporate tax system, it's like trying to catch a, f a fly with tweezers. You know, you just can't get the income because it's so mobile. It's so easily uh, you know, moves across one border and the next. Um, so that has to be a very high priority. The last point I would just make is there is a there's a sense among people in the conservative movement that we're going to get tax reform with just Republicans. You know, Republicans are going to have, you know, we're going to have a huge election as the Republicans are going to win the White House in 2016 and they're going to have all these senators and they're going to have all these House members and it's going to be a, a Republican only thing. I, I just don't see that. I, I think the only way we get tax reform is to convince Democrats. And maybe it is, maybe it's going to union households and saying, look, this tax system is killing you. It's costing you jobs. Uh, you know, high corporate tax system is sending these companies like Walgreens and Pfizer and others overseas. That's bad for American workers. But until we get that kind of bipartisan consensus that we had in 1986, and pr I pray, Mark, that we can see that consensus emerge again. I'm skeptical we're going to see the kind of miraculous achievement that we had in 1986. All right. I'd like to say thank you to our panelists. And now we'll take some time for audience questions. Please uh, state your name and your affiliation. And uh, if possible, wait for the gentleman here with the microphone over here. Hi, I'm Adam Bettman, a fellow at Monument. I just wanted to ask Mr. Khan just a question for clarification. Um, you said that you did not want, that they should not raise the marginal tax rates over 20%, but your argument was go big, go bold. I just wanted to see like the real difference in that. Did you mean go big, go bold in terms of being bigger than 20% or less? I just wanted to get that clarification. Oh, uh, what I meant there, <clears throat> was we ought not to have any rate above 20 percent. And I had touched on it, and my colleagues did, is these revenue estimates from the Joint Tax Committee, which they still use static models. One lesson of tax reform is to ignore the JTC. We did that back in the 78 capital gains fight, as Mark pointed out. I think Mark was the one who recruited most of these model builders. They had their model, so we came up with our models. Um, if I was a member of Congress now, and I was proposing major tax reform, and I knew the JTC would score it wrong, because they always do, I'd say, I'm going to use the tax foundation model. We have Steve Venton here, and Steve has been far more accurate over the years than the JTC. Uh, he's got far more credibility, I think, among most of us who look at these things. And there's a lot of private models out there. I'm going to say, why would you use a model that is wrong? And the public at large doesn't understand all this kind of stuff. And so they understand, OK, I'm, you know, it's like pollsters. I've got my poll, you've got your poll. As long as you have an offsetting one, it proves your point, um, then it negates whatever this so-called official number is, which are, are always wrong. Um, and it, it's important for us just to ignore that. We did in the 81 Act, again, we ignored a lot of the official estimates. And the 86, I don't remember, uh, Steve, you probably remember to what extent they just took the official estimates there. Um, but we, that was part of the problem of using too much official estimate is because we increased the tax on capital, as Mark and uh, Dan pointed out, and that was a huge mistake. T taxes on capital ought to be zero. As Art Laffer and Jack Kemp always used to say, uh, how many uh, truck drivers do you have if you have no trucks? Mm -hmm. you got to have money for the capital investment to employ workers. That's pretty fundamental. And we have to make that point time and time again. If you don't have the tools, 
uh, you don't grow. Sir. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kambi Bhatt. I'm the Pakistan Spectator. And about this question, uh, Senator Chuck humored uh, that, oh, we want to raise in tax for rich people. Uh, don't you think that Democrat win public right there when they say we want to increase the tax for rich people? Because see, if I'm making 50000 and you give me $10,000 more, $60,000, i am going to spend that? Good for economy. But if I'm making $500,000 per year and you give me five or $10,000 more, it's not going to make big difference with the economy because I'm going to save that money. Thanks. Um, well, <laughs> just one or two quick things on this. I mean, I think the thing that's misunderstood about, you know, when, Ob when Obama raised the taxes in 2013, a lot of people forget we had a big, big tax increase in 2013 on, on capital gains and dividends, and which was, I think, one of the reasons the economy hasn't grown the way any of us would like to see it grow and why wages aren't growing, because the, when the cost of capital goes up, you know, wages uh, tend to fall or at least stagnate. And, you know, if you, the way I like to put it is, when, you know, Warren Buffett makes, uh, you know, $100 billion, you know, he can do two things with it. He can consume it or he can invest it. And if he consumes it, he's done paying taxes. And if he invests it, he, he has to pay another round of tax on it. That's the point that Dan was making about this double tax. The, the only thing I'm, I meant to say and I forgot to say is that I think it's so important is when you've got a lot of the people on the left who are taking Thomas Piketty seriously. I mean, th this th the ideas in that book are, I think we can all agree, a pretty crazy lunatic, actually, to say, oh, we could have a 70% tax rate and go back to the 70s. This is the kind of thing that we as a movement who want to see more economic growth and tax reform, we have to be much more aggressive at, at uh, fighting those ideas. I mean, I had thought quite frankly, that we won this fight. I didn't think there was anybody in the world who believed in 70% tax rates, and now there's a best-selling book out there arguing that point. I mean, Richard, what went wrong? <laughs> let, me, let me add one thing on that. After the 78 capital gains tax cut, Mark and I and our allies thought, oh, we've won this. We've right. won the intellectual right. battle. Right. And how many years did it take? Five, six years back, and people were coming back to increase the rate again. And so... Ronald Reagan used to say, first you got to tell them what you're going to tell them, then you got to tell them, then you got to tell them what you told them, then you got to tell them over and over again. Mm -hmm. These battles will never be won. The good news is they'll also never be totally lost. And, um, you know, 50 years from now, they'll have a different panel here, and they'll be fighting the issues. And sometimes we, we move ahead, but the new generation <coughs> always forgets, and you have to re-educate them. And so I've re realized this is a lifetime battle for all of us. Hopefully we can make some big gains, uh, but there's no permanent learning. And those of us who have been college professors in the past also should know that because how, mu how much do the students retain after the final exam? Let me uh, add, respond to one thing uh, uh, about the premise of your question. Consumer spending doesn't drive the economy. Consumer spending is a reflection of the economy. I think there's a cart horse issue here. Uh, what's economic growth? Economic growth is earning more income. Now, the fact that maybe you spend a certain share of that income and some you, you invest, which, of course, then gets spent on capital goods, uh, I think the whole consumer spending driving the economy is a Keynesian construct. And, and I just think if you look at the data, it just doesn't work out that way. So, so, so I, I, don't, I don't care whether somebody saves or invests or versus consuming uh, their income. I care about what are the incentives to produce and earn more income. And that's, that's what gives us more economic output. May I comment on Democrats, Piketty, yeah, sure. and Janet Yellen? Go for it. Okay. With regard to Steve's point about bipartisanship, I think if you deal with very big issues in this country, uh, uh, you need bipartisanship for, the, for it to really work uh, or for it to get enacted into law. Now, the question that, that um, um, Steve raises is, is very legitimate and very profound, and that is the Democratic Party has changed and the Republican Party has changed. And the question is, are there going to be any Bill Bradleys? Are there going to be Dick Gebhardts who united with supply siders to bring about uh, the 86 tax reform? And there were good things that Dick Bradley and, uh, I mean, Bill Bradley and Dick Gephardt did, and that is they favored lower rates. But the concern right. I have is they also paid for those lower rates right. with tax increases on saving and investment. Uh, 
Um, so the question is, are there any Democrats out there? And I'm looking for Democrats, and they're hard to find at times. Uh, who are willing to look at uh, the base, as you pointed out, and not only the race. Mm -hmm. And there are some interesting things that um, Ron Wyden, for example, is saying. One of the things about Ron Wyden, they had a joint hearing on capital gains. And uh, Dave Brockway, you know, who was the, mm -hmm. one of the architects of 86, is you cannot have a tax reform without taxing capital gains as ordinary income. Can't be done. Uh, right. Brockway. And the next thing that happens is Ron Wyden says, well, wait a minute. What we probably could do, taking into account this and that, we could have an exclusion, uh, which would deal with the concern about um, uh, capital. And we could have a, a progressive exclusion, which Richard and I knew is exactly what Senator Russell Long uh, suggested doing. So it affects all income right. groups. Um, and, and this is the whole question about different actors, different times, and different tax reform. So it's obviously difficult. Um, but I think there are some folks out there who are willing to jump in. That's on Democrats. With regard uh, to uh, Thomas Piketty, um, I am consumed with Thomas Piketty. I have Thomas Piketty in French. I have Thomas Piketty in English. And are there any Turks out here? Uh, Turkey just published Thomas Piketty in, in Turkish. Now, why do, I, why do I think it's interesting? I think uh, there are several things. Yes, he's been discredited among academia, but he still pops up. He provides a lot of the intellectual argument uh, for people who want well, Bill to. Gates was just quoting. Yes, and that. Janet Yellen okay. footnoted him. And the book, as you pointed out, uh, there is also, whenever his name appears, comments about Thomas Piketty increase in Congress. Mm -hmm. So he's somebody who needs to be addressed. And I think what is incumbent is that it not be a right-center debate about Thomas Piketty. It be a centrist debate about Thomas Piketty. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there are two interesting polls that just came out. Richard is right, polls are polls. But one indicated, do you believe in the American dream? And the answer was six out of 10 people no longer believe in the American dream as they define it. The second question is, um, those same 60% indicated they favor economic growth over economic fairness. So that American psyche still exists. And I think it's very incumbent then uh, for a centrist response to Piketty because inequality is not going to go away. Now, Janet Yellen uh, is very interesting because here's a continuation about the right. debate. And so my plea is that this is a debate that people who think um, he's been rebutted, are, I, I hope, will still stay in debate. And it has to be um, a debate from the center. And as an example, as you know, Steve, there's a congressman by the name of Jared Polis. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who are very, very good, you're probably not as good as Jared Polis. He entered college with zero money and left four years later with $100 million. Why? Because he did two inter um, internet startups. And somebody like Jairus Polis in the past has spoken out uh, for uh, economic growth over fairness. Okay. Steve Enton, Tax Foundation. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you all for a trip down memory lane here. Uh, Richard, I want to answer your, your question about what we took into account in 85. The economics office uh, tried to have some influence on the uh, 85 and 86 tax debate within Treasury, but the tax office wrote the bill. And they used static scoring, and they wanted it all to be paid for, and they raised taxes on capital by getting rid of the ITC, lengthening the asset lives, and raising the tax on capital gains. The upshot to our horror was that it raised the cost of capital and helped slow investment two or three years later and helped pave the way for the next recession. Rate reductions alone aren't enough. Uh, and if you're going with a broad-based income tax where you're clobbering capital to lower rates, you're going to have trouble. So I guess the question is, if we have a major tax reform again, how do we make it look more like 81 and like the Kennedy bill, which had a lot of rate reductions, but also had reductions in the time it took to write off plant and equipment, a reduction in the corporate rate and an ITC, to get rid of some of this double taxation and not get stuck with this inside the beltway elite uh, broad-based income tax to be perfected and, and, and uh, darn the consequences? That's, that's one question. Uh, the other question, uh, Dan, I wonder if you could comment a little bit more on something you brought up. In the 2009 Treasury uh, contribution to the budget documents, uh, there was a discussion of the difference between tax expenditures under a broad-based income tax, 
where pensions and capital gains relief are considered bad, and a list of tax expenditures under a consumption base or consumed income tax where these things would be normal uh, because you don't want to double tax things. And uh, to talk about something about the, the tax expenditures that are actually relief from double taxation as opposed to actual special treatment. Thank you. Uh, to answer uh, Steve's first question, our mistake in 85 and 86 was having Steve in government at that time where he was constrained and couldn't totally speak out. Fortunately, now he is out of government. And so getting back to my fundamental point, if you're a member of Congress and you're proposing tax reform, you go to Steve and the Tax Foundation now for your numbers. And uh, he can now speak out. Dan? When Steve talks about broad-based tax, that's what I refer to as the Haig-Simons tax base, which assumes that you should be double and sometimes triple and quadruple taxing income that is saved and invested. The consumption base, which doesn't mean that you have a national sales tax necessarily, it just means that you don't double tax saving and investing, so the flat tax is a consumption-based tax. That's the opposite approach. Uh, and when you're talking about something like uh, an IRA, from the Hague Simons or broad-based income tax uh, approach, an IRA is a tax loophole, and they want to get rid of it, which would, of course, increase the double taxation because you'd be taxed on your income as you earned it. You'd be taxed on any returns as it's, uh, as it's uh, in an IRA, uh, whereas the consumption-based tax system, if you don't have full IRA treatment for all savings, that's considered a tax penalty. So whatever you use as your yardstick is critically important, and that's why my very first point and my part of the presentation was you have to get the tax base right. If you don't get the tax base right, uh, you're never going to solve a lot of these issues. Unless well, maybe you can bring the, t the income tax rate down to 1%, then even I'm not going to care if you double tax me. Let me just make two quick points. One, all of the major free market tax reform plans, and for that matter, even some that aren't, are consumption taxes that don't double tax capital or, or, or any other form of income, they tax all factor incomes w w once. That would be the f flat tax, Hall-Rabuska flat tax, consumed income tax, which is another version of the flat tax that, that Mark mentioned and that Heritage has uh, supported, uh, a national sales tax, or a business transfer tax, which Steve called a business sales tax. They all treat capital correctly, and they also reduce marginal tax rates, and they would all be extraordinarily pro-growth. On the tax expenditures side, the, the sort of idiosyncratic version of tax expenditures that Stanley Surrey came up with and are now embodied in the law isn't justified by any theoretical definition of income, because even the Hague simons definition of income would not double tax corporate income, it would only tax income once. So we, we have an utterly unjustified tax expenditure definition embodied in the Congressional Budget Act. We probably have time for one more question. Two, if you want, uh, this gentleman here. Thank you. Um, my name is Daisuke Igarashi from Japanese newspaper Asahi Shimbun. I have a question about uh, corporate inversion. So the uh, Obama ad administration launched uh, uh, measures to avoid uh, tax inversion deals, and a pharmaceutical company, FE, uh, decided to terminate the deal. So just my question is how you know, uh, effective do you think those measures are? Well, it's not just Abvi that terminated. Uh, Walgreens uh, basically backed off doing an inversion, and I'm sure there are probably companies that never went public with it that have also been scared away by some of the political saber rattling out of Washington. Uh, I don't know that, that the potentially illegal rules that the Obama administration is talking about, because in theory, you change the law by going through Congress, not by having some bureaucrat at the Treasury uh, waking up one day and deciding to do something. But I don't even know, assuming those things ultimately go through and survive court challenge, I don't know that that's really stopping inversions as much as a lot of the political demagoguery uh, out there. I know that the folks at Walgreens uh, were worried about Durbin and some of the others making them out to be some sort of Benedict Arnold uh, corporation. Uh, and, and that sort of gets at a more fundamental issue, which is, you know, shouldn't American politicians be thinking about what's good for the business environment in America? And shouldn't Senator Durbin, instead of demagoguing against a company that would still be under an inversion, still be headquartered in his home state, shouldn't Durbin be trying to figure out ways to lower the corporate tax rate, to get rid of our punitive system of worldwide taxation, to fix our onerous depreciation schedules that punish new business investment? Uh, but 
Durbin instead decided to take a cheap shot and to try to go after the companies. And that, for companies, that matters. They're worried about whether politicians are going to make them pariahs somehow. Members of the press and uh, others ought to ask these politicians and just say to them, if you were suddenly the president of Walgreens or one of these other companies, what would your position be? Because they also say, well, corporate leaders have a fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders. And if you're running a company and you're paying far more tax than you're legally obligated to, uh, you're failing your own stockholders. And we have to go on. Again, the British lowered their tax, so it will be down to uh, 20% in, in 2017. They'll be dropping theirs down. The Canadians have dropped their rate down to 15%. And both of them now have uh, corporate taxes, 15 percent? On the federal level. Federal level. And they're now having corporate tax revenues as a higher percentage of GDP than we do. Again, people confuse tax rates and tax revenues, and Steve and the rest of the panel here and I have been involved in this forever. And, uh, you might ask whether it's patriotic for the politicians to maintain the highest corporate tax rate in the industrialized world and drive so many jobs from this country uh, abroad. And by the way, the Tax Foundation just put out a report showing that you used to have corporations leaving the U.K. Now that they've lowered their corporate tax rate in the U.K., companies are inverting to the U.K. So there's a very simple solution to America's problem. The problem is that the politicians don't want to enact it because demagoguery and class warfare, I guess, matter more to them than the health of American uh, America's economy. Okay, we have time for one more question. This gentleman back here. James with the RSC. Um, so in Congress, we've seen basically four plans be put forth over the last couple years, fair tax, flat tax, of course you all mentioned CAMP's uh, tax uh, plan for reform, and also Ryan just came up with one not that long ago as well. Which which one do you all prefer each? And there's also the uh, Marco Rubio and, uh, and Senator Lee from Utah have a tax plan. Uh, I, in the case of CAMP, he was so constrained by static revenue neutrality and also by static distribution tables, and we didn't even get into the problems with those and how misleading they are, uh, that I think Camp tied his own hands so much that he couldn't come up with anything that got anybody excited, and that was more than a one-day story. Uh, Rubio and Lee, I think, have been a little bit bolder, but that then gets into this whole fight about whether or not you want to have a lot of your revenue go to expanded child credits or, or other types of family-oriented tax relief. You don't get a lot of bang for the buck economically. On the other hand, every tax reform plan does have a zero bracket amount for families, so it ultimately is just a, a political judgment how big you want that to be. Uh, uh, the Paul Ryan plan, are you talking about his roadmap plan from several years ago? Uh, it's, it's a BTT. Uh, which, which worries me because a VAT is theoretically fine if you completely get rid of the income tax. If you have the income tax and allow any sort of VAT in, uh, I think that means sooner or later you're going to wind up being France. Uh, so, so that's if we were to have some f disagreement and fighting at this podium, it would probably be over whether or not a VAT could ever be part of good tax reform, assuming the income tax wasn't abolished. I personally would never uh, want a VAT unless the 16th Amendment was <coughs> repealed with something so ironclad that even Ruth Bader Ginsburg and John Roberts couldn't rationalize that an income tax was constitutional ever again. Um, Anybody else on yeah, that? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's too early, you know, in those plans, just because a lot of them are political plans and won't go anywhere. They're either too partisan or they're, they're not offered by se senior members of the tax writing process. Having said that, um, in terms of, um, of uh, comment just made, um, I, I think that what, what Paul Ryan's, he's quite relevant as probably chairman, I think he's, he doesn't have a VAT. I think he's got a business transfer tax. In other words, he's replacing, I may be wrong, the corporate income tax uh, with if, a business transfer if, tax. If wages are non-deductible, it's a VAT. He can call it whatever he wants, but a VAT is wages are taxed at the business level. It's sort of a shadow income tax. Uh, and 
So would you prefer the corporate tax as it is now, or, or his I, corporate? I, tax? I would prefer the cash flow expenditure corporate tax under Harvard Bushka, which gives you everything that you would get under a VAT without the danger of a VAT. Can I? I want to add one thing here. Uh, first of all, I disagree with Mark about needing a person on the right committee to propose it. Jack Kemp was never on the right committees. And Jack Kemp really fired up the tax debate. He had the allies of Art Laffer and Steve uh, Anton and others. But Jack was the one who really changed much of the debate. And he was forceful. But also, they had very simple slogans. You've got it, your tax reform slogan has to fit on a bumper. And a lot of the technical things we've talked about will go no place because people don't understand it. But, you know, having a maximum rate of 20% flat, people can understand that. Um, you know, the, well, the, the Reagan tax reform on business, we had 10 5, 3. People can sort of pick those things up. Cutting taxes by individual taxes, 10, 10, 10. Those kind of things people can understand, and you can build a coalition around it. Then there's the folks here and others who can work out the details. But you've got to have a bold statement. And again, something's got to fit on the bumper sticker. The headline is all important. Thank you. All right. Your references to the uh, paper on the UK. Thank you for your references to the paper on the UK and how they solved this problem and how we could perhaps copy it. Uh, there's some other place, uh, pieces on the website uh, the audience might be interested in. We've done an analysis, several of Piketty. Yeah, and this is a tax foundation. A tax <laughs> foundation. We've done an analysis of Monsieur Piketty, and we've done an analysis of the camp bill. The sort of plans that these gentlemen are preferring would add about 15% to the GDP. Monsieur Piketty would take away more than that and reduce the GDP by more than that with his high tax rates. Those uh, papers on the website might be of interest. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, and this concludes our event today. Thank you.